This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome once again to another edition of Off Planet Radio. Off Planet Radio TV, offplanetradio.com, offplanetmedia.net are the websites. Don't go there right now because they've been completely shredded. Instead, go to youtube.com forward slash offplanetmedia and especially go to um, patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia. And uh, if you find this show of interest, that's where you get the full effect. We're going to sit down and have um, what I think is going to be a quite different and refreshing conversation. Um, as my guest pointed out, you know, we put out a lot of, uh, a lot of content. Sometimes it's kind of dark, and I don't want that all the time. We need to deal with that. But um, I want solution-based We'll call it deprogramming, okay? We, we put out programming, but we actually put out deprogramming. So um, I think um, the show tonight goes a long way towards kind of turning a corner on some positive things and some things that give us insight into who we are, why we're here, and oh my, there we go. This so is the police sirens in the background. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, apologies. Yeah. But um, did you know that uh, when you came in, you had software running? And this software runs in a place called the unconscious. This was, this was defined by um, Carl Gustav Jung in the early to mid 20th century. This software actually is encrypted, but there's keys to it. And the keys are the things that go on around you in symbols, sigils, icons, and strange events that are designed to wake you up because it's you sending you a message. My guest comes to us um, by way of introduction, I guess, through James True, mm -hmm. everybody who um, has done amazing work in decoding things. And... Uh, She's going to sit down and talk to us tonight about archetypes and what they are and how they work. She has a phenomenal story. Um, at one point in time, was diagnosed with uh, type 4 lymphoma, lost everything. And in the midst of her struggle for survival, she found the keys that opened the door to a life of success, vibrancy, and discovery. She is uh, an entrepreneurial and archetype coach. And uh, I want to introduce this audience to my guest, Beth Martins. Welcome off planet. Thank you so much, Randy. That was a beautiful intro. I think well, I'm going to transcribe that. <laughs> <laughs> we go by the cuff here. So um, that was yeah. awesome. Welcome. It's good to have you, you on. Um, your story really is quite phenomenal. And the more I dug into what you were doing, the more I realized I needed to talk to you. Ah. Because uh, sometimes I have selfish motivations for guests. And aside from that, I want to share a discovery process with the people that I commune with in this internet sector we call Off Planet. But uh, tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to the place where you began to heal, deprogram, and then move forward in your life. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm honored to be here, by the way, Randy. It, uh, I, I, I love your work. I love the people that you've been hosting. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the work that is going into the truth or movement for better and for worse at a lot of levels. You guys have been there for me through uh, a very extremely tough past year and a half since awakening to all this crap that's going on in the world. So I just want to acknowledge you for that Thank before you. we set out. 
you know, I thought my, I thought I'd been through a lot of hard stuff already. And, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> there it yeah. gets weirder, gets weirder. Yeah, well, and I will say this, if I see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think, mm. you know, I think we all do that. I think that's what this game is really about is mm -hmm. lifting each other up. So Amen. Know, when one of us falls, the other one pulls the other one up and we keep going. So you got it. You, you, got you were it. relatively, you relatively newly awakened. Although I suspect that you've been awakened a long time on different levels. You have a, you have a spiritual background. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I noted that you traveled India several times and mm -hmm. studied under a yogi, mm -hmm. and are quite versed in meditation and yoga. So mm -hmm. clearly, you're not a newbie here. You've just kind of dipped your toe into the dark end of the river, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, well said, actually. Um, I, I've, you know, since probably anybody who has spiritual inclinations, we all, and I certainly have memories as a child of putting myself in trances and, yeah. you know, having very mystical dreams yeah. and uh, dealing with entities, uh, you know, like having, having visitations and having things go on that were unexplainable, but no adults in my life had any means for talking to me about right, it. Exactly. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, there was just had no context yeah. and, and you tried to pretend it wasn't happening and go unconscious about it. Um, I was at the same time raised by two entrepreneurs. My father basically had a nervous breakdown working for other people. And so him and my mom got together when I was very young started to build their own business. And so I was very much raised in that world that was giving me the clue that you didn't have to just do what people told you to do. You didn't have to just go and toe the line, get a job and uh, you know, follow what society says is prescribed for us. Uh, I worked for them for many years and I did, at the same time I was going to school, I did a degree in anthropology. So I started to study the work of Carl Jung and I was always searching for cross-culturally what was the same in human spirituality because you could see that all the religions were at war with each other. There was so much conflict and I wanted to find, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to find that common thread that I, I knew instinctively there was something human, that there was something we shared yeah. collectively yeah. at the level of the soul and the spirit and, uh, and, and archetypes were it. So I, I studied about them in a more intellectual way. Uh, never, never really got it at the soul level. It was more like fun. Um, I began traveling to India every year. That my first couple of trips, I realized, wow, this is gonna be expensive. <laughs> I, I'm gonna need some yeah. way to support myself. And uh, despite having got a gold medal in the anthropology degree that I have, I was qualified to do nothing. So I thought about my, my parents' business that had always supported me financially because uh, I like to work at it. I'm, you know, I love actually having responsibility. I love making money. That's something that was always part of who I am. And then I thought, okay, well, suck it up because I had a hard time growing up. I had a hard time facing, you know, my first word was no. I, I knew instinctively as a child that things were not right that the world was upside down. There was a lot of BS out there. I was the one who called it out and nobody liked me because of that. And, uh, you know, so this was a time in my life when I thought, okay, Beth, you know, you've been freewheeling here for a long time. You've been, I don't know if freewheeling is the right word, but you've been fighting for a long time, actually. And I thought, okay, just grow up. If you want to be strong financially, it's time to suck it up and do something you don't like. I thought that was what I had to do. Yeah. And I went into business full time with my parents. I, I, not that I dislike business. Somehow I'm, I'm a business nerd. There's something about it that I think it's fun because it gives people an opportunity to do things that it's like, you know, when my parents went into business, their parents said, oh, you're going to fail. It's never going to work. This is terrifying. And, and then my parents took it as a challenge. Like, well, watch us. We're, we're going to do our very best and make, it, make this happen. And they did build a very successful business themselves. So I went to work for them. By the time I was 25 years old, I was named the vice president of the company. But by the time I'm 29, next thing you know, I nearly dropped dead of a stage four lymphoma, as you said. And the reason being that I got so far out of alignment with who I actually am at the soul level. I was, 
I was selling out. I was, you know, again, more, more doing what I thought I should do. Um, you know, trying to fulfill on my family's desire to have me be part of their sure. business. I was the yeah. only kid, right. I was the only kid who took an, an interest in their life, in their, in their business life, I should say. And so, yeah, I was doing, doing what I thought I, I should do, but lo and behold, I'm just not one of those people. Some, some people can go through their life doing what they're told. And for me, it's just kind of hardwired to really to the archetypes, which I, I didn't know at that time. I couldn't have put two and two together, but all of a sudden I was fighting for my life and, you know, went through a number of trials and tribulations and three years, I had no idea it was going to turn into a three year struggle, literally trying everything to survive. Um, I, uh, I was trying to avoid Western medicine because for all my studies, I knew there were different ways to approach health and well-being, but it was just not meant to be that I was going to get a cure that way. So I had been through 11 months chemotherapy that almost killed me. I had a near death, a near death experience, not, not that like, you know, see the tunnel and the light near death experience, but uh, like you I damn was near died. I damn near died. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I had one. Yeah. That's what happened to me when I got into the medical system too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, unfortunately my cancer was considered curable. And that means that they throw the book at you with the treatments. They come at you so hard because they figure you can take it. And, uh, and that's what nearly killed me. I didn't know what I was dying of anymore. And it was really a, a death of spirit. All of my sense of fight was gone. All of my optimism was gone. You were saying, you know, we're, we're not starting out on a positive note here with your, your, your first positive show. But uh, <laughs> It was just that it was that absolute, okay, everything's gone. I, I lost all my possessions. I lost my house. Yeah. And, and here my body was slipping out from underneath me. And it was the first time in my spiritual life that I, it was the rubber meets the road kind of thing. Okay, you know, I'd, I'd done all this almost like a little kid in an innocent way, playing with spiritual energy, playing with mantras, playing with that concept of immortality. And it was at that point when I was just flattened. And even that wasn't, I couldn't pull up this, oh, I'm immortal, I'm blissful kind of thing that I had been chanting at that time. And I completely surrendered to dying. I let go. I said, okay, bring it on. I'm, I'm ready. And in that moment, I saw myself. I saw who I actually am with nothing, right? Because we identify, or I was identifying myself as so many things, my career, my house, my money, my cats, my relationships, all that kind of stuff. Uh, most of my friends were gone by that point because they cannot handle watching somebody die that they're yeah. close to. They just run yeah. head for the hills. You look like you're familiar with that. And yep. uh, so I got to see myself with nothing. And there I was like, oh my God that's who I am. And I, it was the opposite of what I expected when you die. It's, it's, I was filled with joy. I was filled with a sense of love and freedom. I was happier than I'd ever been in my, uh, you know, real life, so to speak. And I got some important messages about myself that I had a specific purpose on this earth, that it was a kind of contract. There was something, you know, hard, hard wired. It was set. If I didn't accomplish it this lifetime, I was just simply going to have to come back and do it all over again. And that not only it wasn't about me, it was that that was a big thing. It's not about me at all. It's, uh, it's how I was tied in with humanity. Yeah. Um, you know, there's an insight because when you start to think about how we interact you and i would not be sitting here having this conversation you yeah. wouldn't have all the hundreds of conversations that you've had over the course of the years since your recovery but understanding that life is not this like recycling project there actually is a momentum that you gain in a lifetime and the mission if you call it that um really is the connection points between all the other people that we interact with. That's really a big insight. Mm. 
so so beautifully put. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, I I I saw about myself that the last thing that was so clear is that I was utterly fulfilled. I, I apologize about the sirens. I can't do anything about okay. it. I'm on, a, I'm on a thoroughfare. It's all part of the ambience of of real life. I love it. <laughs> we get dogs barking and sirens and cats that go flying across the room. Um, it's all good. <laughs> that could happen. Yeah, it could yeah, happen. Yeah. <laughs> yep, somersaulting cats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it was it was the the idea because I've been really chasing fulfillment. You know, every trip to India for me was, I was chasing enlightenment, like I was going to get fulfilled. I was going to, you know, finally find happiness. I was going to be completed in some way or another. And getting financially stable was all that. Okay, when I'm financially stable, then I'm going to be fulfilled. When I have the respect of my parents, then I'm going to be fulfilled. And so in that moment, when, when everything was gone and I saw actually I'm fulfilled, I knew I never needed to do anything again in order to fulfill myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge shift. I still feel like I have to remind myself, it's one of the reasons I'll say it over and over again, that that's the case because it's so easy to forget and get back in that stream of like, oh, running around trying to add things to something mm -hmm. that's already complete. Yeah. But uh, so it was a knock them down. I actually went into remission having had this experience, I came out of it. I felt high. I felt happy. Um, I turned the corner with my health. All of a sudden, uh, I was diagnosed not having cancer anymore. And it was kind of a miracle. But at the same time, I had been through so much chemotherapy. I was so worn down. I was so worn out. I couldn't recover. And 18 months later, I was re-diagnosed again with the second version of the same cancer. But when they when you go down for the second time, they consider that you are actually going to die. There's, in terms of the uh, statistics, show that people don't recover from that. Mm -hmm. So it was that time when I thought I'd faced my death already, to tell you the truth. And I'm like, okay, guys, you know, I'm I'm kind of done with this, but here we go. And I was offered a stem cell transplant as half a chance to live through the experience. And half those people who do it die in a in a in a actually very violent way. Yeah. So I was faced with this major decision, and it was at that time when I was re-reminded about archetype work, not even, it was a pure synchronicity, like you were saying at the beginning, uh, ac almost like accident, because I didn't, I didn't think to myself, Beth, archetypes, I, not, I did not have that thought, <laughs> yeah. but I was following the work of Caroline Mace, mm -hmm. and she had just published Sacred Contracts that year. I knew I had to have that book. So I got that book and I opened that book and it was practically in five or 10 minutes, I got the key to turning the corner. And it was that, you know, every archetype is either existing out of a place of consciousness, which means love, or it's coming from the unconscious and it's a fear thing. And I, you know, I looked, I looked around, I'm going like, God, what's happening here? I've been doing everything I could possibly have done. I'm doing everything right. My diet's right. My thinking's right. My meditation is right. My medicine is right. My doctors are all right. Everybody's right. And still I'm losing my life. And so what, you know, what could that be? What could that mean? And I, and I just got the key. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm letting myself be driven from fear. And, you know, eating the best food, but out of fear of dying and, and taking the best medicine, spending thousands and thousands of dollars. I, I, I practically bankrupted it on how much I invested in my health, but it was all going down the drain as fear energy. And uh, I literally, I tweaked it through, with, with the help of one archetype that I know to be the rebel, also kind of a mermaid thing for me, if you saw any mermaids in my zone. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. going to talk about that. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, uh, so I tweaked it and I didn't know it at the time, but I began to recover from cancer and I never had to look back. It was literally in the next three months, four months, I was up in front of people singing with my guitar. This was 20 years ago, by the way, this, uh, just so mm -hmm. you know, this was a long time. Okay. And uh, I was invited to sing at a conference. They, I was treated by one of my nurses to be a kind of miracle recovery. They had me singing in front of a bunch of uh, nursing oncologists because they see nothing but you know, hopelessness oh, and devastation. Yeah. Death, that's, that's death row. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So they're like, please come inspire our people. Uh, I was singing for people in the very ward that I had received treatments. I was there 
singing to give them, you know, a, a half a bit of hope or inspiration and, and uh, beauty also yeah. is a big, big yeah. theme of mine. Uh, so it was a complete turnaround. And, and after that, it was so clear to me, I was never going to go back into the corporate world, which was where I was a fish out of water. You know, I, I still like business. I like marketing. I like communication, all of that. But the corporate world, it was soulless. It was faceless. It was absolutely purposeless. And despite my love for my family, I knew also I did not have to die for their yeah. business. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot to unpack there. So how does one tweak a synchronicity when first off you mentioned to the rebel and the mermaid the rebel is very interesting because i think out of all the archetypes that's the one that i've probably embraced the hardest mm -hmm. and i've embraced both sides of it because there's a place where being a rebel means that you wind up pushing back against a lot of energy that's defeating you because what I discovered was pushing back wasn't constructive anymore. There was another way to do this. The mindset of the rebel is one thing, but I have to say that I've been slow coming to understanding I can't live my life in that mode because it's exhausting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Well, this is the big key that's actually the cornerstone of my work right now, whether I'm teaching someone to build a business or recover from their success actually is something that I've been helping men do uh, more recently in my work. And it's, it's an energy quotient that we have been really tricked about what it means to gain energy and what it means to lose energy. And we have a lot of fake energy, pseudo energy coming our way in the form of dopamine hits and, you know, uh, it's like fake yeah. love and all kinds of fake stuff. It's very believable that, uh, you know, even you can just see, I would always see this. I was a, an avid music consumer as well as a musician as I was growing up. And yep, me I too. Would, we share nice, that. Nice. Yeah. Lots in common. Yeah. yeah. Got guitars so, sitting back here. Awesome. Keyboards Beautiful. all over the place. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Um, <laughs> and And so I would go and see a band and then everybody's like, going wow it's so amazing and they're cheering and they're freaking out going this is so great but i'm going like wow i feel like crap i can i can see they're technically talented and yet i could also see that i it was causing me an energy loss i didn't feel good after i saw them and then you could go see somebody else and maybe they weren't nearly as good technically but all of a sudden i'd be like totally uplifted there would be you know very high energy and so I was already on to that. And that's where, you know, with, with rebel energy, this is, this is actually what was killing me. I was squashing that rebel. I put my foot on the head of that rebel. I said, get away. You're hurting me. Yeah. Right. I got into yep. a lot of trouble, bad energy, bad actions. And, uh, you know, at, at the same time now, I, I know that I was a rebel without a cause. Right. <laughs> Exactly. I was, I was fighting. <laughs> or as anything. I call it a rebel without a clue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's it. So I really had to own that part of it. And now, now I, 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 the rebel is central to how I teach. It's to me, it's part of that mermaid cluster of archetypes and the, you know, the, the key being you have to see what is your fight you have to get so lucid and so clear because there's a million fights out there and there's way more than you know, even than people know, or than I knew. Yeah. So you can lose all your energy going in every single direction, fighting endlessly. And, and then, you know, here's another big thing is that rebels prefer not to work in, in their shadows, sure. yeah. right? They True. would rather fight than work. Exactly. Yeah. So I was, I was a self victim to that. Uh, they, you know, uh, 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 very victim to boredom also. You just named the victim word very lightly, another powerful archetype. But uh, so there's, there's places I really needed to clean up, like everywhere. But, but, but trying to just push away that rebel energy doesn't work either 
because any archetype you push it away, as I'm sure you know, it comes at you even stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Yeah, I'm real familiar with that, the boomerang effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When it comes mm -hmm. back, it's loaded with energy and it's all dark. Exactly. And I feel like the, the purpose of that is, is not to, it's not as sort of demoralizing, like, you know, way to suck the life out of us as if we're the enemy of creator or God or whatever, maybe word you use for that. It's, it really is all for our awakening because by, by, for me to push away my rebel energy was kind of like losing a limb or two. I was losing mm -hmm. part of who mm -hmm. I am and part of how I'm meant to awaken on this planet. And so by, you know, by saying no, disowning, for me, it was a very strong disownment. That's just not me de-identified with it. It had to get my attention. I had to say like, no, actually, I'm your superpower. I'm your ally. I'm here to help you. And I'm personifying it. I actually don't believe that they are, they are alive. They're, they're more of a blueprint thing that we, we express through or a lens that we see and, and see through and, and hear through. Well, there are but, aspects of ourselves. Um, I don't know how familiar if at all you might be with the Seth material, Jane Roberts, which goes back to the 70s. But, I know of um, it, but not super familiar. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so when I was 17 years old, I started reading the Seth material. At a time when I was wide open, at a time when I was suffering some really bad repercussions of things that happened to me in early life. Mm -hmm. And that material opened up, if nothing else, it gave me a perspective that we are a multiplicity, that mm -hmm. our focus in this world is very constricted by the consciousness we inhabit, but in fact, that's an, an aspect of us focused in this life there are other aspects of ourselves that populate around us and we become aware of them. So they, in a sense, are a personification. And for me, that fit with the concept of the archetype in a way that helped me understand what I said at the beginning of the show. That we kind of have this coding and the coding comes in forms of messages we're sending to ourselves our, our oversoul. That's what Jane Roberts called it, the higher self. Mm -hmm. You know, it connects us to source. It's bigger mm -hmm. than we are. Mm -hmm. We can't contain all that we are in this consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the Seth concepts married to the archetype for me were a way to con conceptualize this ability for communication to come from a place that's both out there but yet is actually coming from inside of us. Mm, mm, beautiful. So that's kind of, that's kind of my perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it's interesting. I was listening to a talk of Carl Jung's the other day, and, and he actually feels like they are, are felt, you know, who knows if you talk to him now. But uh, he, he described them as if they were alive, that they, that they, had, yeah. they had life force. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm a rebel, yeah. <laughs> as we're talking about. Well, I think to draw back to what you were saying, mm -hmm. if they don't have an external life to themselves, we animate them. That's it. They, this is it. in turn, inform us. You know what right. I mean? Right. It's, it's true, right? It's true. You, I think you're getting some, my, I'm just putting it together. It's like this, because I, I, I'm often thinking about um, a magnet. And the poles mm -hmm. of a magnet, mm -hmm. so that you know, like the unconscious and the and the, and the consciousness, uh, we think of them as kind of a, we might think of them as opposed to each other. But if you put iron filings around the magnet, you're actually going to see it's an arc of it's a movement. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's just what you said. It's just what you said. There's something. Yeah. Well, if there's a law of attraction, mm -hmm. there's also a law of repulsion, the push mm -hmm. away the mm -hmm. force, the array around it. Mm -hmm. And that, boy, that's a conversation for a whole other, whole other show. Wow. Right. Yeah. 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 So, we just blew the lid off that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I think the way these things work is probably different for everybody. 
-hmm. And I think of the way we decode them. Um, it seems to me like you were in touch with the concept before you conceptualize it, which in my, mm -hmm. the way I work is I usually have an understanding of something long before I have anything I can put my fingers on. I just mm -hmm. intuitively sense that. Mm -hmm. And I think we unconsciously work with this because it's the unconscious material. Th you know, you comment on this if you want to, but, we're working with unconscious material. We're manifesting, we're pulling material in, mm -hmm. including the things that afflict us, our diseases, the things that happen to us, the weird shit that goes on, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the horrible stuff that happens, the trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so all of that comes out of the unconscious and it's all material. You know, if you just looked at it as material, it's not neither good nor bad, although it manifests that way. So the archetypes to me are a lot like that too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's a beautiful subject because it won't be completely unraveled. No, never. You, 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 you can't sit and be the expert of it. You, and it's bottomless, absolutely bottomless. It doesn't matter how much you know about yourself at this level. There's, yeah. it, you're, you're always going to be, uh, and it's beautifully humbling. Does it, honestly, after a lot of work, you think at some point you're just going to, you know, okay, I really, I, I know. Yeah, I'm the manifest, I'm the manifestation yeah. archetype expert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But no, life is really meant to, because I said it the other day and, and I think I've said this and I know you probably have heard it, but you know, the point of, of life is not to be awake. It, it is to be awakening. It's a process. Yeah, I just yeah. had this conversation with somebody mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking for an end point. We're looking for ascension, the event. We're looking for, uh, you know, the second coming or something. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what this is. This is a process. Mm -hmm. And it's an infinite process. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I got more comfortable with it when I realized there was no end game. There are simply a series of landmarks that we hit along the way to the next most interesting thing we're going to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's kind of now the way I view it. I'm almost like a tourist. Mm, beautiful. That's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and I often am thinking this, I, I don't know a nice way to say it, but we're so brainwashed. Oh, that's okay. We're fine with being blunt. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You know, we're so brainwashed with seeking happiness as if that, that yeah, is yeah. this thing that we're, we're searching for. And I just feel like it couldn't be farther from the truth. The more, you know, the, the deeper life gets, the more actually I'm open to suffering. And uh, the more I'm into taking in, you know, I used to run with blinders on. That's why I, I didn't know. I knew it was bad out there, but I wasn't willing to watch the news or to, um, you know, like just really focus. And I was also brainwashed by that message that, oh, if you pay attention to the negativity, it grows the negativity. Well, well this is a deception of the love and light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. A new age deception. Exactly. That I screamed about. I mean, because I, I love these people and I see where they're at and I know they're all embracing and, and they have this expectation. But what you pointed out earlier, a lot of them have not done the shadow work and it bites mm -hmm. them in the ass every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's something where you, it, you can see with people who haven't been through uh, big betrayals or big devastations or they have never had to face their mortality in any serious way, how afraid of me they are. <laughs> they don't want to be my friend exactly because they're, you know, we're all staving that off. We're all like, okay, you know, yeah. that unconsciously we're running from death all day long. And there is one, one of the practices that I do, it's, it's really about, it, it can be quite morbid according to some people. And I'll say, you know, it's really dealing with, let's say the first archetype of the, I call it the, the Merpreneur's journey. It's also, also the King Hero's journey. It was just my take on the hero's journey. It's, it, it's, it's nothing mm -hmm. new. It just turned out that I, discovered it internally and then i realized like oh my god <laughs> this is the hero's journey and uh you know so the, the first the first archetype that shows up is the child 
And it, the, the, the first order of business is to be betrayed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. to, to accept your calling, to, um, you know, to do anything extraordinary, to step out of that mundane, somewhat meaningless kind of existence going through the motions and, and not having deep awakenings. That's, you know, you actually must be betrayed in order to begin this journey. Right. And, and people are like, no way, man. But what, what do we do anyway? We call it in one way or another. Right. With the, the relationship falls through, the health falls through some kind of thing that we can't control. Yeah. Wow. That's an interesting concept. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm just sitting here spinning through this. Um, I've shared this with the listeners before that I was, uh, sexually molested between the ages of eight and nine, something that I saw I've been, one of your interviews. I've been yeah. um, over the last few years kind of dealing with. And um, when you said that, I, 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 cause I've played with this concept and I've talked about it. I've talked about it with my wife. I've talked about it when, with my therapist, are, are we calling this in? Is this, is this like a deal we made? Is this part of this contract? Is this like an agreement? And you know, honestly, I'm hearing more and more practitioners out there, specifically some people who are working in the areas of healing and energy medicine say, yeah, kinda, we kinda did. And that's a huge thing to deal with because it makes you, it makes you responsible for that, not, in the sense that you are guilty or not in the sense that there is blame or recrimination on yourself. But one of the concepts that I've come to work with is responsibility means you own what happens to you. Mm. And once you begin to own it, it's a different perspective because what you own, you control. Mm. And when you said that, it really resonated with me in a way that I had not looked at this before, this, this concept of betrayal mm. and how we mm. can build on that and not let that become the big victim status. Thank you for right. that. That was awesome. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, I love what you just said. That was, that was such a big key for me in setting out when, when I, I went through the betrayal of my own body was, was like shutting down on me and, you know, having cancer and like, oh my God, what happened? I'm going like, yeah, I was I was busy using my spirituality to vacate my body, and then it got so sick, and and it it was like a betrayal. So I'm going like, okay, who's to blame? Like, you know, oh well, there's fluoride in the water, and there's, um, you know, chemicals chemtrails. in every product, and there's yeah, yeah chem chemtrails I wasn't familiar with. Like, oh my god, chemtrails right now, <laughs> out of this world. Out yeah. of this world right now. I've been freaking out all day. I got a, a good headache, I think, building mm -hmm. from them today. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it was, I found everybody to blame, absolutely everybody. And, but I had nothing. And so I, I asked myself, I was smart enough to say, okay, well, who's responsible? And I could only come up with one answer to that question. And that was me. And it was exactly what you said. Like all of a sudden, all this power came into my system. And the, I, had, I finally had the ability to respond because as long as it was all outside forces in my perception, then I had no control whatsoever. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of control, by the way. That's another spiritual myth that I mm -hmm. think is garbage about let go of control. That's yeah. BS. Good luck with that. You're in control, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's this this whole demonization of the control freak. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's an obsessive aspect to that. And I've certainly crossed it a number of times. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's that's part of, again, playing with all of this, 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 this material that we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. You don't want to unleash what you're capable of manifesting unless you're capable of controlling it. And... Mm. Say that again. That's deep. You have to be in control of it in order to, I, I'll mess this up now because I'm never good at repeating. So basically, you're not capable of dealing with what you manifest unless you can control it. Because one of the things that I posit is we have no idea how powerful we really are. 
what mm -hmm. we manifest. Exactly. Literally everything around us, if you follow uh, even the Eastern teachings, we're kind of manifesting this reality. Mm -hmm. um, the sansara, the illusion, is simply the creation we place in front of ourselves. And it's a cooperative universe where I occupy this universe, you occupy it, we agree on certain rules, but pretty much we have our own universe, our own pocket universe that we kind of occupy, and we do what we want with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, mm -hmm. you've got to be in control of it. That's, that's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, there was a, a really great distinction from a, a process to some modality, and I don't often um, give much promotion of modalities, but I ran across something that was uh, so incredibly helpful for me while I was struggling really intensely through the chemotherapy. And uh, if you're familiar with a Tibetan pro um, practice called Tonglen. I'm not. Okay. This is a very beautiful, and it was a window into a, a whole world of working with the emotional, spiritual energy that instead of, you know, because we have this weird sort of like, um, you know, we think of it as a truth, you know, kind of common knowledge almost to say, well, in with the good and out with the bad. That, that sounds, to most people, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. But Tonglen turns it around and says, no, in with the bad and out with the good. And so, you know, I'm so sick with chemo. It's, it's unbelievable, the, the experience of it. It's like your, 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 your cells are, are dissolving. Your, uh, you're being attacked. I won't go deep into the experience of it, but so, so I tried this because the, the Dalai Lama and a few other Buddhists are recommending it. I'm busy like reading, trying to get as much knowledge as I can. And I was amazed. I thought, well, how could I breathe in this suffering? I'm trying to get rid of this suffering. How could I breathe it in? But I, but I, I decided, okay, Dalai Lama says that I'm going to try this. So breathing in the suffering and then breathing out the antidote. And then round two, breathing in the suffering on behalf of all of those who suffered the way I am. And then on the breath out, it's for the sake of all of those suffering, breathing the antidote, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And this was like, ding, <laughs> such a big light went off for me because you see, like, first of all, it, it, it's, it's the beginning of being able to navigate that emotional underworld that is so frightening and so scary and, and in the sensual underworld too, because we keep so much of our physical body in the unconscious, just, yeah. just, just our feeling, you know, just our senses are, are, mm -hmm. are completely put under. And so it was at that point when I, when I started to become an adept at, at that underworld and I, I started taking it on and I started realizing my power and, and um, I came across, so I used that for a number of years. Working with archetypes is a release process, right? You, you have to go into the unconscious. You see yourself, you feel yourself. And through the seeing and the feeling, you bring light to it. Just automatically, there's light where there used to be shadow. Now, the job's not totally done because, you know, I, I reclaimed from the unconscious, I reclaimed enough energy to heal from cancer. And that's, that was a lot. But I, it's not like I stopped suffering with my rebel. It was, it's an ongoing study. And, uh, and still, of course, it is. And I came across another technique, the very long answer to what you were talking about with control. But the, there was a, a fellow, Lester Levinson, who lived in the 1950s. Uh, he was born in the 1950s, or pardon me, uh, was more like an adult. He, he was an entrepreneur. He was a physicist, total genius engineer i've heard this name before have you yeah. yeah yeah so he he created a process of release and he was dying of a double heart attack and his doctor sent him home to die kind of similar story all of a sudden they're yeah. going like we can't do anything for you and because he was so smart he went home and he went like i don't think so i don't think this is my time and he reasoned his way to the the um the method of letting go of all of his feelings that weren't love. So basically, you know, all his apathy, all his grief, all his fear, all the lust, all the anger, all the pride, all mm -hmm. the courage, all the acceptance, all the peace, what we consider to be very high and good feelings. He just cleared the deck completely. 
and he completely recovered from his illness. So it was like a major breakthrough. And then he spent a number of years trying to decode what he had done so that other people could do it because it was at that point he needed to be this like teacher or guru to people in order for them to get anything from his, you know, he totally awakened, not only recovered from his illness, but completely awakened. And, uh, and then, so he developed a process that was so simple and foolproof for anyone who's brave enough to, to watch it, um, uh, pardon me, practice it. And, uh, the ego cannot, uh, withstand through it. Many people don't, especially spiritual people do not like it, but the, the gist of it, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not about that control is bad. It's that wanting control is bad. As soon as we're in that lie of lacking and wanting control and trying to get control, right? That's, where, that's why we call people control mongers because okay, they're trying to control it, somebody. It. It's a really thin, that's, that's a really fine distinction, but I get it, yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. And it's a great distinction because then you don't have to go through this sort of hypnosis of like, oh, let go of control. That's like, oh no, but because then it's a, you know, can I swear? It's a, it's a mind fuck, right? Like that, you know, oh, I'm letting go of control, but it's not true. So like, that's not helpful if it's not true. This is about, this is, about, I want reality, right? Like I want to deal with what's, yeah. what's real and true if at all possible. So it is an extremely fine distinction, but it's, it's been a very powerful one in this letter. Um, maybe last five, seven years of my life now. So these archetypes, do we cycle through these? Is it predictable? Is it random? Is it something that is sort of purpose-driven in the sense that uh, the hero shows up, the uh, hermit shows up, the, the rebel shows up, the child shows up? How, how do you view this as a process? One of the things that Archetypes has gifted me with is the knowledge that the universe is highly ordered. It's not, it's not chaos. Right. It's highly ordered at the level of our emotions and at the level of the archetypes and, you know, natural order as, as a whole. And what I discovered, you know, just, just recently was actually um, after my mother passed away, 2017, New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a it was a very big knock him down. I that was my second parent in two and a half years. Um, you know we we had their parents for twenty years more than 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 we had them. Uh, so it was a really big devastation kind of yeah, experience. That's, I went through this. My mm. parents died within thirteen months of each other. Oh wow! And wow. my Sorry father, the, I I heard your interview with Freeman, and mm. uh, I know what he went through. Uh, my father had dementia. My mm -hmm. mother passed before him, so we were left to care for my father as he descended into the last stages of dementia. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, the loss, the loss of a parent is, parents is profound. Please go ahead and talk about that, because this, mm -hmm. if you haven't experienced it yet, you will, because it's inevitable and it's it's tough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah again humbling like if there's not enough humbling experiences in life that, that and, and you think about it god everybody's been through it why yeah. why you know why can't i just accept it and move on uh and and i and you do eventually but uh for me it's everything that i've ever been through there's there's some part of me that says okay what can i make out of this and it's like what, what you've been through and been so brave to share about your childhood. It's, you know, when, when we talk about meant to be, I have a hard time with that because then it starts to yeah. sound like, oh, these perpetrators were like right on for doing that. Or, or it's right that my parents died 20 years before their time, if they're, whatever their time was. Um, I, that, that's not what I, what I mean about it, but it's like, okay, how can I use this experience yeah. to to build something new in my life to have some kind of awakening to have a, a, a deeper relationship with spirit and myself and and ultimately hopefully be of more service in the world too and uh and so that's what i was doing and also we have to be out in the world it's not like you know if you could just wipe wipe the slate clean and not do anything after that and you know not have to show up for my kid or show up for my clients or show up for 
um, you know, to make a living, all of those things, if, if that weren't the case, then nothing yeah. would really be pushing you to the next leg of the journey. But it was, you know, it was just like walking in the dark. I'm going like, what the heck could be next? And so at that point, it's just following breadcrumbs and going, okay, like, God, give me something. I need something to work with here. The, the, the mermaid archetypes had come to me on, on the heel of, heels of my father's death. I already mm -hmm. had that. Mm -hmm. Now, after my mom passed away, I ended up working with a coach and she was into uh, story marketing, which I'd never really got into, but it's a very, very beautiful, heartful, ethical means for marketing. And it, just through, through telling your story and showing who you are, being, being vulnerable and open. And uh, she turned me on to an author that uh, Carol Pearson, if I'm getting her name right, I won't remember the book, but if your listeners want to know, feel free to ask me. And uh, basically it was a bit about the hero's journey, which I had studied about. So I knew, I knew about it. I knew Joseph Campbell's work. I'm just rereading now because oh, it yeah. had been so many years ago that I, I had read that. I always forget to mention Joseph Campbell, but he's, he's in that, that pantheon right there. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, he's a biggie. I felt I felt morally obligated to actually go and reread his work right now because I've done so much work on the hero's journey from an inner perspective. That's always my way. I go in first. Mm -hmm. I do all my discovery inward, and then I poke my head out and go, "Okay, like does this match with anything or anyone?" And very often you're going, "Wow, I made a, a, quite a discovery." Uh, Self congratulating, but at the same time, <laughs> I'd rather. I'd rather see it inward first and, and then it feels authentic. It feels bona fide. It is authentic. It, that's an authentic way to work. And mm -hmm. both ways are, you know, I admire people that are deep researchers and I interview them all the time, but mm -hmm. I've been more experiential. And I think that's what you're talking about is that we've, we kind of blunder into these concepts and then we go, yeah, you know, that's pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. That's okay. why I was attracted to, to yeah. your show. Because I, I heard you say exactly that, right? There's so many people out there that they have a lot of facts, but they haven't necessarily done the inward journey. Yeah, no. I, and I think, and, and Emily, Emily and I have both said this, that you can't research your way to truth. You can only use research to understand what you've already uncovered. The process is internal, mm -hmm. you know? Very nice. Very so nice. everybody's everybody's mm -hmm. at a different landmark somewhere. And we forget that. We go with this cookie cutter mentality mm -hmm. in the alternative media that you're not, you're not woke enough if you don't understand this or you don't believe that or you don't have this concept and it's not that way. You know, there's, mm -hmm. believe it or not, there's still things I'm stretching to deal with all these years and i mean we've gone pretty far off the rim on this show but there's still <laughs> shit that i'm going i don't know I, I still can't wrap my mind around this and mm -hmm. see that's healthy that's that's a healthy skeptical way to do inquiry mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know, it's exactly it's, it's self it's a self-discovering process mm -hmm. there's a place for the researchers i mean joseph campbell for what he did is irreplaceable. He right. brought something into the mainstream that had never been really discussed in what you would call a popular medium. Mm -hmm. he, he took something off of the shelves of academia, pulled it down, dusted it off, and made it really vibrant and interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And, and then revealed that order that is there of, yeah. of what can feel because if you just place yourself, and going back to your question, such an, it's such yes. a beautiful question, that you know, if if we just because we're kind of locked in time and space a little bit, we're we're here, and there was what we had before, and there's what might be ahead of us, but we have no idea what that is, and there's a certain myopia in it. There's a, there's a real short sightedness in it, and when you when you step back and you look at oh oh my God, there is a whole journey here, and it's somewhere it's pre writ like archetypes, it's it's set. It's set. And by finding yourself in that journey, you discover, uh, first of all, the, the, what it means where you are right now. Suddenly you can give meaning to that. Yeah. You give context to it. You can see how far you've come, which we almost never give ourselves credit for. 
what we've already accomplished. Yeah. And then you can also see, oh my God, what's out in front of me. That's like invaluable to, to all of a sudden see the step ahead. And at the same time, just to complicate that heck out of it is you see that you're actually on all positions of the journey at the same time. Yeah. Right. That's pretty That's, interesting. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. That, and, and then that became, I, I became lucid about this, that, that past year, what my role is as an archetype coach, again, whether it's to, for the purpose of finding the value of your purpose, so you can actually get out and, you know, have a business based on your life's work, or if you're just trying to make sense out of like the chaos that you might be going through or a breakdown or trying to reach and stretch and grow or, 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 um, you know, create your own chaos, which growing really is then you've got you've got this map you've got something that you can follow and and the map is actually a, a gross oversimplification yes it, yeah exactly it, it yep. totally right so it, i always say the map is not the destination it is mm-hmm. simply the set of directions that we're so spoiled now with gps but i actually used to travel <laughs> old old school with maps in my glove compartment you know, and pull off and navigate. The map simply, it's a flat space. It doesn't show you the hairpin curves and the places where the car can fly off the cliff. And it mm-hmm. doesn't show you the scenic spots either. It might point to it, but you have to actually yeah. go see them. It's an analog for the real thing. It's not the journey. That's right. It's, it's a point of entry. And it, it's like, it's meant to trick you into taking the journey yeah because if you saw the complexity of it then you go like nah i'm not up nobody ever it. got a flat I can't tire do that. reading a map you know or right down at the side of the road or nice nice no. great analogy great analogy exactly yeah so then um you know if you go to my website for example there's an archetype quiz there it takes you five minutes to find out where you are on the journey and i'm not going to pretend for one minute that you're going to see like, the, the whole entirety of your of your life purpose in that, but you will get one little snippet at one you know one one place to start if if it's the beginning of your journey or it's the beginning of a new journey, because that's something that's also very much been revealed to me, so to speak, or I've discovered is that it's not it's not just cyclical, it's it's spiral, right? We're taking we're taking <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we're taking this journey. Uh, so many times over and over and over and over yeah. maybe it's lifetimes of doing it but even during sometimes before breakfast you cycled the hero's journey several times and so there's you know the the beauty is that if you know that the 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 purpose of the game of it is energy reclamation to to take what's being lost in the unconscious and to free up that energy, to create that free energy, then it doesn't really matter if it's oversimplified. I was able to, like with one archetype, I saved my life. Even yeah. though, you know, and I went on after that to, to really dive in and see, okay, what the heck am I doing on this planet? I know I, I felt into it, it's like you said, I couldn't put words to it. I, I saw it, I felt it, I knew it, but it's like, okay, what am I contracted for here? What, I know there's a contract. I better know what it's for. And, uh, you know, it was, I treated it like a full-time job to create my own archetype wheel and uh, have this sense of who I am. And, uh, and it, you know, but I still was able to save my life by working with one archetype. So that's the, that's the power of it, that it gives us such a, a beautiful window into the navigation of that that uh, world where all our energy is tied up. Most of our energy is tied up there. Yeah. So people can go to your website. We're winding down on this first segment and I want to give you an opportunity to let people know a little bit of what you want to be said about what you do, your website, contact information and things that uh, you might be of service to others with. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I am, by the way, writing a book. Uh, I'm about a uh, third or or uh, close to half of the way through my first draft of, of this book. I'm really serious about putting it out 
It's called Journey. So I'll, I'll, I'll get you to look at that. It's a, a map of archetypes to find lost purpose in a sea of meaningless myth. So you can, you can start to watch out for that in the next months. Cool. And uh, in the meantime, I have at my website a number of articles you can look into. Please do fill out the, either the Merpreneur's Journey. So there's kind of two stages that I'm working with people right now. I've worked with women primarily. Maybe in the second hour, we can talk about why I'm a we recovering will. feminist. Excellent. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I've worked with women so much uh, over the past 10 years, really exclusively almost uh, market ex marketed exclusively to women and gained a lot of experience about how to help them take their, their soul's purpose and turn it into a business so that they don't lead a double life the way that I did. Uh, is it everybody's destiny to have a business the way, you know, the way that you're doing your work and finding your way, you know, Freeman, we talk about Freeman, that's his take on it. It's not necessarily everybody's. I will never, ever convince anybody to have a business. But if you're like me and you can't live the other way, right? It just, it, I couldn't live through it. And so if, if, that, if you know that it, it's your thing, that you have to do your purpose full time, then feel free to knock on my door. You can fill out a form. I'm actually creating a special page at my website specifically for Off Planet. It's just bethamartins.com backslash off planet and you can go you can fill out the either the merpreneur's journey archetype quiz which is more geared towards women or now i have the king hero's journey quiz which is more geared towards men they nice. are the identical archetypes but the journey is different they look different and one of my goals with the book is to show how men and women can see each other and mm -hmm. stop that war between them if if there is one even though it's unconscious people will say oh no i don't have that war going on yes yes you do we're in the midst of that yeah. war big time we right really now. Are. Yeah. 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 It's a major battleground. So the website is bethmartins.com and then you can forward slash that off planet. And exactly. that'll take you over to the page that you've created for our viewers. That's exactly. awesome. I don't think anybody's ever done that before. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay. That's nice. We're, we're, we're going to break here. Uh, those of you on the public channels out there, if you enjoyed this hour, you can uh, pick up the full effect, we call it, the full, usually two hours, uh, sometimes more, um, of this program and all the other stuff that we have there. Um, off planet, yeah, no, I'll get this right, I always mess this up. Patreon.com forward slash off planet media. Uh, $3 a month will get you in the door and you can decide if you wanna go a little higher um, on, on where we are in the membership thing there is a new website coming that will eventually supplant if not replace patreon because we want to gain control of our content again so all of that's coming uh you can find us there and uh beth martins thank you for joining us on this side we're going to jump to the other side we'll talk about this uh this mermaid archetype and then we're going to get into um a recovering feminist and why men probably need to learn this stuff too. Do all that on the other side. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. The truth is out there, it's inside you. Now go find it. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.